All right, so welcome to the JSAL Center for Continuing Education lecture series. Uh, we're excited today to have Dr. Aaron Jackson, noted military design expert, distinguished visiting professor at the Canadian Forces College in Toronto. His day job is a senior researcher in joint planning and design in the Defense Science and Technology Group of the Australian Dep uh, Department of Defense. Uh, is a defense civil servant for almost a decade and serving member of the Australian Army Reserves for going on 17 years. So with that, uh, please welcome Dr. Aaron Jackson. Uh, thank you everybody for coming along today and for sacrificing what I presume for at least some of the people in the room is your lunch hour to do so. I do appreciate the support and the audience. Uh, as Nate said, uh, I work for Department of Defence, specifically Defence Science and Technology in my day job, but at the moment am a Distinguished Visiting Professor at Canadian Forces College. And I'd like to thank both of those organisations for releasing me uh, so that I could be here today uh, giving this presentation and also so that I could be here for the rest of the week as a visiting instructor on the introductory design course run here at JSAL. It's certainly been a very interesting learning experience and it's a pleasure to be here. My brief today, uh, I need to make a usual disclaimer being a defence employee, which is that my views are my own, this is all unclassified. A previous version of this presentation I presented at a conference in February. Uh, I've enhanced the presentation a little bit uh, to take into account the feedback from that conference. Um, and the paper itself I'm turning into a monograph which hopefully will be published later in the year. Now, for those of you that are in the room today and not just watching this on the online video, I have a special bonus, which is that I have some hard copies of the paper that was delivered at the presentation, which is about an 80% solution towards the monograph. So please feel welcome to take a copy of that away for your further reference. Everything that I'm going to talk about today is contained in, in that uh, presentation slides with a few exceptions at the end of the brief where my thinking has developed uh, a little bit more about what the possible future of military design thinking might look like, and that will come out in the monograph. I want to begin by talking about the inspiration for this project, uh, which goes back to 2018 and to a completely different conference. So the military design movement is something that's been growing over now probably about half a decade prominently since about 2013, but it has its antecedents, and we'll discuss this in more detail going back into at least the 1990s, depending on how you define military design, and perhaps a long way back. But since 2013, there's been a, an increase in the amount of contact between military designers, both internationally and between different branches of various national militaries, including my own and the United States military as well. And through that network, we've begun to self-organise. And one of the really good outcomes of that has been uh, the Innovation Methodologies for Defence Challenges, or IMDC, conference series, which started in 2018, and then this presentation was, was at, at this year's. And in 2018, I presented a conference paper, which is part of a project that is still ongoing for me, and has been now for a couple of years, looking at a possible multiple paradigmatic uh, military planning methodology. So what we have at the moment is a military planning method. In Australia, it's called the Military Appreciation Process, or MAP. Uh, that's our equivalent to the JPP, or the Joint Planning Process in the United States. Both of those are very similar to the individual service publications in both countries. And they even having incorporated some design methodologies, so the Army uh, design methodology in the US Army, the uh, operational design methodology uh, in the joint US publication, and also we have our own thing called scoping and framing, which sits at the front of the, the JMAP as an equivalent in our joint doctrine. So we've put in some design methods to help us better understand the problem and the environment, but then we have a single paradigm method for trying to solve the problem, and that is the remainder of the planning process, which says, okay, you, you've done the work now to understand the environment and the problem. The next thing we're going to do is define our end state, break that down into objectives, break the objectives down into decisive points and sequence those along lines of effort that are all leading towards that one end state. Now that method is feasible sometimes, other times it doesn't work so well, but the point is that it's a single paradigm. So what I was looking at is how can we perhaps come up with a multiple paradigm planning method so that your planning doctrine goes from being something that you read from the beginning to the end and you go through the steps to something that looks more like a choose-your-own-adventure novel, 
where you might start with uh, an initial framing activity or some other design activity to understand the situation of whether you've got a problem and what might be the best way to manage it. And if you think it's a simple problem, turn to page four. If you think it's a complicated problem, turn to page 25. If you think it's a complex problem, turn to page 60. And then you can go through a number of different methods from different paradigms to potentially tailor that planning process to better suit the individual circumstances. So this project is, is still ongoing. Uh, and I've refined it somewhat, but the initial research findings that I presented at the 2018 conference are now up as a blog post on uh, the Archipelago of Military Design website, which is militaryepistemology.com. Uh, it's run out of Canadian Forces College, and it's a very good hub for publications. There's over 100 different publications on there at the moment about military design. This blog post is one of them, uh, and this presentation is what inspired the research that went into the project I'm talking about today. And the reason for that is because of something I wasn't expecting. So here's a good example of design and emergence. I put up a slide when I was briefing this presentation at the conference, which mapped different paradigms. So you can see here the white uh, labels are the different paradigms I was investigating and talking about. But then over the top of them, you've got the gray uh, bubbles, which show clusters of paradigms that, that are similar to each other. Uh, the red bubbles, which look at where different uh, methodologies are. So down on the right hand side here we have our different kinds of civilian and military design methods and up here we have our traditional military planning processes and then the darker grey bubbles over the top indicate the work of some key design thinkers. Now this slide was a side product, it was something that I did to organise my own thoughts and I put it into the presentation only because I thought that it looked visually interesting and it was a sidebar conversation that I glossed over for a, a couple of minutes in that presentation thinking that that would be the end of it. And it turns out that this was the most memorable and most talked about and discussed slide of the presentation. Uh, and also afterwards, in fact, uh, out last night at, at dinner with some of the staff here at JSAL who were at that conference in 2018, this slide came up again. So it's clearly something that stuck in people's memory. But for me, it was just a thought experiment to see if I could map relationships between these. It was based on my hunch, my initial, I suppose, educated guess, you'd call it, from having done the research to put together the multi-paradigm toolkit. So I came away from that conference and I thought, I'm going to investigate this further and I'm going to come up with something that is based on a more thorough data set and more thorough research of different design methodologies and the paradigms underlying them and where they all go. And that led into this project which tries to map paradigmatically different civilian and military design methods and compare and contrast those. To set that up for success and to do the research, the history of those design methods and where they came from uh, is something that I've also had to go through in some detail. And that has actually been incredibly useful because one of the things about designers is they focus on innovation and creation and disruption. And these are all future focused things. But quite often with design, we don't stop and pause and say, well, where did we come from to get to where we are? And the answer to that is not 100% clear cut because, uh, and I've mentioned this before, in other presentations as well, if you take 10 designers and put them in a room and say what's design, you'll get at least 11 answers. So how you answer the question what is design determines how you find out about the history of design and what that history means and where design comes from. So I had to take a range of different definitions of design leading into the different paradigms to look at the history underlying them and it became a almost circular and an emergent uh, self-reinforcing process of, of going through these different iterations of the history and then adding them into the paradigms and then finding new paradigms that then informed further historical investigation. And the original outcome was a distilled list from this initial, I think there's 14 or 15 paradigms in there, uh, down to a list of now nine. So I was able to group and cluster some ideas that initially looked uh, different but were similar enough to each other that I could put them into broader groupings. And I've only put the headings up here in the slide but in the hard copy of the paper, and certainly will be included in the monograph, is a table that discusses the definitions of each one of these, where the sources they come from are, and, and how the paradigms operate. A paradigm in this sense being a model for thinking about the world and how things work within it. So each of these different paradigms has a different way to view reality and to view the actions of militaries and other actors and other stakeholders, and also to view design methods and design processes. Here's some examples, though, so that we're not going completely blind into the rest of the work. So uh, what I was able to do with these nine paradigms is subsequently map them into a quad chart. And on the quad, what we have is uh, on the vertical axis, we have a process orientation 
and a relative mindset orientation. So the process orientation side looks at uh, what are the sequence of steps. So technical rationalism, which I've spoken about already, which is what our traditional military planning tends to sit within, is a great example of that because we're looking at a process being a number of steps. We do our framing, we do our determine the end state, we do our determine the objectives, we break those down into DPs, we add effects to go with those, we add measures of effectiveness and measures of performance to accompany each effect, we sequence them all, we figure out the timeline and, and then there we go. We've broken this problem down into steps. So you can see from the definition that's up there on the slide, and my apologies for the text heavy slide, this is the only text heavy slide in the brief. Uh, you can see up there that it's about thinking rationally and applying logic uh, that leads to an understanding of the world as it is rather than as it appears to be. Uh, so technical rationalism emphasises analysis conducted by deductive reasoning, which is uh, employing reductive methods to break problems down into component parts and analysing those components to derive an understanding of the whole. On the horizontal scale, you'll see there's an emphasis on problem solving versus an emphasis on problem framing. Now, problem solving in this sense is I'd like to think fairly self-explanatory. That's, well, what are we going to do to fix this? Problem framing uh, in my study is defined as thinking about or conceptualising the problem. So this is more of an external, we're going to go out into the world and act, whereas problem framing is more of an internal, how do we think about and perceive things and why do we do that and how is it important? So at the right-hand side of the horizontal scale, the emphasis on problem framing uh, really conforms to the idea that the designer is having an intellectual dialogue with themselves or an internal dialogue about the problem and how to confront it as opposed to the left hand side where we've got problem solving which is about the designer going out into the world and fixing things and doing things and acting. Uh, so technical rationalism sits up in the top left quadrant because it's got a process orientation but it's also got a going out and solving the problem orientation. You know, we're figuring out where we want to be and how to get there. That's very much going out into the world and solving things. The exact opposite to that, and this is a word that uh, is not particularly popular in military uh, speak and in military parlance, and so I use it sparingly, uh, and that's postmodernism. And you can see there from the relatively smaller text that I was unable to summarise this as concisely as the rest uh, of the paradigms that were in this skill set, but and you'll, if you'll excuse me for reading the slide, uh, it's defined as, uh, for this, this study, objective reality and empiricism as a means to understand it are both illusory and must be rejected. Destruction of these illusions, or sorry, deconstruction of these illusions is achieved through the perpetual reinterpretation of meta-narratives and their language. There is no definitive meaning and openness to alternative and even competing interpretations is paramount when seeking understanding. All perspectives are equally legitimate, even if utterly contradictory. And ultimately, problems can therefore both exist and not exist at the same time. So this is the exact opposite of the technical rationalist approach that most militaries like to take. So we're looking at an emphasis on problem framing. We've got multiple competing understandings of the same situation, some of which may not even see a problem as a problem. They'll see it as something completely different. Other perspectives will see a problem. Both of those completely contradictory perspectives are equally as legitimate as each other, and it's on the designer to try and develop an understanding of both of those. And that's why it sits in this mindset orientation. This is really about the designer's understanding of the world, as opposed to about going out and acting to solve something. And you may, having gone through this process, end up deciding that you don't have a problem at all, and that you uh, don't even need to go out and solve it. So problem solving may not even end up being the ultimate outcome of the design process. Can you still hear me on the mic? Uh, looking at the other quadrants, and I'll go through this fairly quickly, uh, at, at the extreme end of a process orientation but an emphasis on problem framing, we have participation. And this is something that I think we don't really do within the military, but it exists in the interagency space. And what this is in summary is that meaning is derived through interpretation of social interactions uh, and ongoing interactions between actors caused by negotiation leading to shared meaning. So you can imagine taking a number of actors from different agencies and different stakeholders in an operating environment. You sit down in a room, and I'm sure there are people in the room who have done this, and you try and figure out, well, what's the problem we're actually trying to solve here, or what's the activity we're trying to do, and why are we trying to do it? And you have very different perspectives from each of the different stakeholder organisations because of their experience. So this participation as a, a paradigm looks at, you know, we go into those meetings and those discussions, and we have a dialectical method 
whereby we uh, use an unstructured process, so getting everybody into the room is still a process, but within that room there's not necessarily a structure of exactly how we're going to talk through the issues, but at the end, uh, once we have enough empathy for understanding the perspective of the other actors in the room, uh, we'll be able to accommodate different views of the problem and eventually we can reach a mutual understanding which we can then go forward into action. So that's about uh, problem framing because we're talking about developing empathy for others and changing our own viewpoint on something, but it's also a process orientation within that paradigm because of the act of physically getting people into a room and talking to each other. And the final one down here uh, as an example is heroism, uh, which is where uh, groups of peers establish expectations of performance, rules of behaviour, and what is good and bad behaviour and how they ought to behave. And then when they confront a situation, the expectations of that behaviour are applied. Uh, and that includes when they're trying to solve problems. So ultimately the individual, uh, their adherence to the collective moral code is what's emphasised. Uh, and the individual is inseparable from their deeds. So what you do and how you act, whether or not it's in accordance with that moral code and therefore good and bad is what counts. Uh, and if you want a practical working example of that, uh, the Greeks in Homer's The Iliad conform to that because they are a band of warrior brothers who will dictate a common moral code to one another based on their mutual interactions and will expect people to be heroic in accordance with their understanding as a collective of what that means, hence where the name heroism comes from. So there's an emphasis on problem solving because we're going out into the world and we're acting, but it's got a mindset orientation because our actions are dictated by our group perception and our mutual understanding of things, not by uh, an emphasis on problem framing. We don't really care about fixing the problem, we care more about our own behaviour uh, conforming with group norms. So that's four examples. There are nine paradigms overall. I won't talk through the other five, but I did plot them relative to each other within this quad chart on the vertical and horizontal axes. So we ended up with complex adaptive systems as a paradigm sitting in the middle because of the nature of complex systems, you need a rough balance between a mindset uh, and a, pro a problem solving uh, correction, sorry, between a mindset and a process orientation. And also you need a roughly balanced mindset between problem solving and problem framing. Uh, and then the other four paradigms included in the study are dependent on the definition of those as to where they wound up. You can see it in the slides for those that are interested. Have a look at the paper and that will detail what they mean and what they ended up in there. So that was my framework for analysis that I eventually put together and was, was able through testing to refine down to the model you see here on the slides today. The next step was to take the history of civilian and military design and figure out how it fit within this fr framework of paradigms. So the first step behind that was to trace the history of design thinking. And I wanted to separate civilian and military design thinking because at the moment, uh, it's only really been in the last couple of years that military and civilian designers have started really seriously talking to each other. Uh, before that, and I'll come to this with the history of military design as well, they were very separate movements uh, and separate processes and they were run at different institutions and there wasn't that dialogue which is beginning to open up. So trying to trace the history of both at once and just calling it design, I've considered that would have been a misrepresentation. So these will come together at the end and I'll analyse them both together but I needed to treat them separately in order to get my initial uh, examination completed in a way that I was satisfied would add some value and add some benefit. So this slide shows the history of civilian design thinking. You'll notice with the, the dates down the left-hand side uh, and the different coloured arrows that this looks similar to, and I've got it in a later slide, a work on the history of military design which was put together by Jay Sowell's design program director, Ben Zweigelson. Uh, and so I took his template and I thank him for giving me permission to do so and I used it uh, for my own uh, representation of the history. So civilian design, it depends again on the definition, uh, how far back it goes. I consider it to have started in the 60s as a self-conscious movement that was called design. So the actual term design and the name design emerged, uh, correction, sorry, in the late 1950s, uh, but then became popularised in the early 1960s. And it came out of initially two places. The first one was at MIT. And there was a professor down there called Buckman, Buckmaster Fuller. Uh, who developed what's called industrial design. And that still exists as a type of design today. It's come all the way through to the present through a number of iterations as a particular design method. Concurrently in Scandinavia, they developed something called cooperative design. Uh, and that emerged in the, in the 1960s, and that still exists today. And that's why 
I, I think there's a prominent, a prominent, certainly on the course we're teaching this week, of students from Scandinavia and the Scandinavian countries, and they seem to be very open to it, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and that's because they've had this in civilian methods uh, for many, many years, and so they're, they're relatively more used to it. It's not as novel or as new a concept. But what's interesting with these two types of design and the civilian aspects of them is they're designed to make products. So you're talking about big companies in the civilian world and they want to design a better product. So how can I make a chair for someone to sit in at their desk in their office that's going to be more comfortable or that's going to be more functional or that's going to have something that differentiates it in a novel and interesting way that makes it sell more as a product. So it's more limited in scope in terms of what it does. And the difference between the two methodologies is that industrial design achieved this by taking a number of experts in any given field and putting them in a room and giving them a design methodology. Cooperative design works by taking end users or lay people who use the products and putting them in a room with experts to guide them to design the product. So they're both designing products, but one is looking at it from uh, trying to get experts to innovate, and the other one is looking at it from the perspective of trying to get lay people to inform that innovation uh, based on their user requirements. Uh, design science in the 1960s, it comes and goes. Uh, so this is where design for a brief period gets called design science, uh, and uh, the works of, of two people in particular, Simon and, and Archer, and the details of their works are, are in the paper. These two guys, uh, talking about design science, came up with something that was about taking a problem and breaking it down into parts to understand it better. It sounds very familiar and very similar to military planning, yeah? And um, that's because it was. It was about, in, in, they talked about problems in the natural environment versus the artificial environment. In the natural environment, you have science that can solve it. So the methods of physics, the methods of biology, the methods of chemistry, etc., can be used to solve those problems. But in the artificial environment, which that's their term. I would say the social environment of human societies would be a better way to describe it. Uh, their design method was about, well, how do we, in that social context, solve problems? And their answer was effectively an applied scientific method of breaking things down into component parts, analysing the parts, and then reassembling that analysis into an understanding of the whole. That kind of petered out towards the end of the 1960s. And uh, design very quickly moved back into considering itself an art. And there's a debate that emerged in this era which has never been resolved, uh, which is, is design a kind of art, a kind of science, or is it neither of, or both of the above? And the scientific perspective these days is a very small minority of probably very few, if any, designers would consider it scientific. But there is an ongoing debate now about whether design is an art form or whether design transcends art and science and any other discipline and by its nature is a multidisciplinary undertaking or activity uh, is actually none or, none or all of the above or, or parts of the above. So uh, there was some works that came out then in the 19, early 1970s reoriented us back into industrial design and designers and art. And in 1973, uh, Howard Riddle and, and Weber coined the term wicked problems. And this is where we really start to see design and complexity beginning to interact. And that fed into then the work of uh, Richard Buchanan in the, the early 1990s who developed something called service design. So it's again using a process of experts in a room, but now what we're talking about is not developing a product, we're talking about developing a service. So something that's not a physically tangible representation, but it's nevertheless something that is required that we don't have yet and we want to innovate and invent. Uh, at the same time in the 1980s, uh, cooperative design comes from Scandinavia into the United States and starts getting taught at some of the design schools that uh, are emerging towards the late 1980s. And here it's marketed as participatory design. And originally it's just the English translation of the Scandinavian cooperative design, which it took about 25 years to actually get that translation and to get that awareness uh, of the fact that the Scandinavians were doing something like this. So participatory design kind of emerges in the 1980s and is developed in English in the 1990s concurrently still ongoing in Scandinavia, but here it then turns into something called user-centered design. And around the kind of late 1980s, early 90s, we, we stop seeing participatory design methods mentioned as a label. We start seeing user-centered design uh, methods mentioned as well. And the difference there is that we're still taking teams of lay people to design things, but once again, we're now moving on to designing services that users want, as opposed to designing products that people want. Reflective design in the 1980s, this is something a bit different. It comes from Donald Schoen, and he 
perceives design as something different to teams. He sees it as something an individual does. So a designer is a person who gets to a problem they can no longer solve. And the only way to go forward from that is to reimagine your entire circumstances to the point where you render the problem irrelevant. Uh, so problem dissolution as opposed to problem solution or problem resolution. And that emerges in, there's a key book and I'd recommend it called The Reflective Practitioner, which is brilliant, which talks about how you can do that and how you can engage with the problem. So he introduces this idea of design as a mindset rather than a process. All the other processes up to this point, or sorry, all the other methods up to this point are processual primarily. And all of these things together then go into shape human-centered design, which emerges around the turn of the 1990s and has since become the prominent method which is taught in places like the Stanford D School, uh, IDEO, which is a big, big design company, a lot of the other top design schools that teach, teach this human-centered design. And it is a method that draws on, as you can see, service design, reflective design, user-centered design, and the cooperative design stuff primarily, as well as other influences. And it strikes a more even balance between design as a mindset and design as a process. And it also uh, has more options uh, for how to design, and therefore you've got more flexibility in it. But ultimately, it comes down to uh, several steps, one of which being uh, empathy, identifying needs, uh, test or developing something that might meet those needs, testing that something and then throwing it out into the world once you, you're happy with your testing and going through that iterative cycle as many times as you need to until you, you've got the end product you want. But it also expands the scope. So we've gone now from products to services. So now we're designing systems. So we're, we're going even broader and we're looking at beyond just something that's, you know, it's a, it's a localised service. How can we take that and design it for an entire society to try and drive that core change? And that, since the 90s, has been dominant and, and design methods now are still going through that process. Paradigmatically, what we see then is when we take this history, it starts in a kind of design science technical rationalist framework and we move through Rittle and Weber discovering complexity theory in the early 70s into something that is close to a radical Structuralism with the works of Cross and Schoon in the 80s where they're talking about designers are now starting to reframe as individuals as opposed to in the process. And then when we get participatory design in the late 80s from Scandinavia, uh, we've got a strong process orientation, but we're closer, a slight problem solving one, but we're closer in terms of our mental mind state and user centered design moves that back into the framing space. And then finally, human centered design appears here near to the centre of the chart because of all of its influences that come into it, uh, but it is of note slightly more process driven because ultimately no matter how you mentally reframe things as an individual designer, you ultimately need to go through the steps as a team to come out with an output at the end. And it is also uh, almost a mixed mindset and process orientation, but again slightly more on the process side because your mindset informs the best <coughs> way to do the process, not the other way around. So that's the paradigmatic trends map for civilian design. The history of military design, I won't go into in as much detail because most people in the room have more knowledge of it. Uh, this is the original slide from, from Ben Zweibelson's slide deck uh, that appears in the reading list for the introductory design course and it appears in, there's a blog post that Ben wrote uh, on the history of military design which appears on the Over the Horizon uh, website, that's a blog from the US Air Force Air Wake War College, I'd recommend you Google it, you can find this graphic in there. So this is the graphic, my thanks again to Ben for letting me use it. As a result of my own study I made some modifications to it and I wanted to give it more of a historical timeline. So I took it and turned it into this. Now the difference here is a few things, so going back to Ben's slide, he has his civilian design methods down here. I've taken the ones from the previous slide, I've squished them in, and I've stuck them down there with the same arrows going up so we can see the different civilian methods and a breakdown of how each of those methods has influenced different militaries as opposed to just taking those as one block. The other thing I've done is I've changed the timeline because we have a minority but growing opinion in militaries that military design, or sorry, military planning is actually a form of design. It's a single paradigm design method using technical rationalism to try and find a way to solve your problem. And if that's true, then military design has actually been around since the 19th century. That makes it look a lot older than civilian design. However, it still probably isn't. Because a couple of key civilian designers, Harold Nelson and Eric Stoltman, in their brilliant book, which I'd recommend to you, it's called The Design Way, 
They argue that design is the process of inventing that which is needed but we don't yet have, right? And it's, it's, I'm paraphrasing this, not an exact quote, but by their definition, humans have been doing design since we were hunter-gatherers because we've always been creating things that were needed uh, that we don't yet have. In which case, I couldn't possibly map any of it on a slide because I couldn't fit a timeline that long into this presentation medium. So on the civilian slide scale, I didn't bother, but on the military slide scale, I wanted to, to say that, well, military planning, we can trace formal planning processes to the mid-19th century for two reasons. One is the emergence of military staff colleges and education academies at about that time. And the other one is the accompanying emergence of doctrine as training manuals to teach people in those military academies. So that's where we start to formalise our planning processes into military doctrine. So if military planning is a form of design, it goes all the way back down here and comes all the way through to the present. If military planning is not a form of design, design starts here in the Israeli Defence Force in the mid-1990s, thanks to the efforts of uh, Naratai Brigadier General Shimon Nabe, who originally applied uh, post-structuralism and post-modernism to an analysis of uh, Soviet operational art and then from that tried to uh, invent a new Israeli form of operational art and in trying to invent it realised that that wasn't what he needed, what he actually needed was a form of design. So he came up with a process called systemic operational design which went into Israeli doctrine uh, until the mid-2000s at which time it was thrown out. And this is now a history that I'm onto that I think most people know because it was at first thrown out of Israel at about the same time America was getting interested, Nave came over here, started teaching at SAMS uh, there was design incorporated into the SAMS curriculum from 2000 and, uh, 2006, 2007, but more formally it began to become a, like a course as opposed to just test studies around 2008 and carried on through. The Israelis have since brought Nave back in around 2013. Uh, the US Navy War College at their uh, design centre teaches a civilian method taken directly from the Stanford D School Human Centric Design Method. Uh, the United States is now uh, turned its early experiment with design into a formalised uh, army design methodology or uh, operational design methodology at the beginning of its doctrine and has, has turned that into doctrine. Uh, the Canadian Armed Forces at the Canadian Forces College have started teaching their own design module since 2013 and that goes through iterations that I will come back to in a couple of slides time. Uh, my own country experimented with complexity and complex uh, complexity theory on operations with adaptive campaigning in the mid-2000s uh, and since 2013, we've had a number of different engagements with design in an ad hoc manner, uh, where a number of individual designers in different environments have applied different design methods, including uh, my own background, putting it into our doctrine as, as the scoping and framing step at the beginning of our second edition of our JMAP. Uh, we see the Brits from uh, 2011 putting design into their doctrine and the rest of NATO from 2017 starting to experiment with it. So now we're seeing Scandinavian countries, Poland, uh, Denmark, some of the other NATO members beginning to adapt different design methodologies as well as, as just the UK. With, uh, by the way, the UK doesn't use the word design, they use the term understanding in a similar way. So we're developing an understanding of things. Uh, and then finally, there's individual military design theorists, uh, including in Jay house Ben Zweibelson, uh, the Israeli Defence Forces, first Shimon Nave, who's not in the arrow. I'd have to extend the arrow down to about probably here if, it was, if Nave was included. But uh, after him, since the mid-2000s, I'd say Offra, Offra Gracie is in there. Uh, at Canadian Forces College, uh, Philippe Baleo brazard I could go on and keep listing names. National Defence University, Chris Paperone, uh, US Army Special Forces, Grant Martin. Uh, I could keep continue, I'll stop there, but there's a number of individual theorists now, and you can find their work on the militaryepistemology.com, the Archipelago website. Those theorists are developing their own methods and models which are different to the doctrinal models. And that has become an ongoing discourse alongside these arrows which represent the formal adaption by militaries of different design methods. So that's our military history. When we map this paradigmatically, we see a couple of things that are different to the civilian design methods. The first difference is that it oscillates a lot more, right, between the two extremes. The second, sorry, not difference, the second point is a similarity, which is that the oscillation goes from the top left down to the bottom right in the same way the civilian design stuff does. So if we take military planning as a form of design, it's very heavy technically rationalist stuff here. We have John Boyd in the mid-1980s, who's the first prominent theorist to apply complexity theory uh, to military operations. We have, uh, noting the arrow doesn't necessarily indicate a direct intellectual lineage, it just indicates the passage of time. We then have Nave in the mid-90s, who is very strongly postmodernist, 
and rejects all of this. Alex Ryan, Australian Department of Defence, wrote a lot of individual theory stuff, and this is where our own adaptive campaigning then fit in as well. He was not an author of that, but uh, he, that was written by a team and published institutionally, so we see it design coming back in the mid-2000s to complex adaptive systems. And then doctrinal design methodologies sit up in here, because they tend to reject this kind of postmodernist approach, but they're happy to incorporate elements of complex adaptive systems theory to give us a better understanding of the environment before we then apply technical rationalist theory to solve it. So that sits directly between those two paradigms. Uh, we see the work of, of Paperon and, and Zweibelson in the, the early 2010s uh, being kind of radically structuralist or a little bit postmodern as well with their own development of design theory. But more recently, Zweibelson and the Canadian Forces College, and by extension of, of some of the work that Zweibelson and his team here have implemented at, at JSAL, or I'd argue JSAL as well, we see that the most recent design methodology is kind of sitting again close to the centre of the quad chart, but this time slightly more emphasis on problem framing than problem solving and slightly more emphasis on a process orientation than a mindset or orientation, but still fairly close to the centre. And the reason for that is because these methods are blends of other methods. So at the Canadian Forces College, they have an approach called agnostic uh, or they have something they call the agnostic approach to military design methodology. And what that is, is they will take their students and their 04 level course, or their uh, 06 course, and they'll give them a different design method every day for most of a week. And they'll have an introductory brief in the morning, they'll go away, they'll implement that method to work on whatever the challenge they've been given is. And they'll do a different method, same challenge every day. And then on the last day, they will blend those methods together, taking whichever bits of whichever methods they think are the best, and they'll put those methods in together and they will uh, come up with a, I won't say solution to the problem, but I'll come up with an answer to the challenge that may take the form of a solution to the problem or otherwise, depending on what the method is. Now, every year, the people that are presenting the methods change. So every year for the last few years, the Canadian Forces College has given each cohort of students a different bag of tools to go away with. Here at JSAL, uh, zweibelson has been talking about taking a mix, uh, and he does this, there's a good article he's written on Small Wars Journal, uh, blog. It came out in, in 2017. Uh, it's called Second Generation Military Design. So he talks about all of these things are first generation. Second generation is going to take and combine all of them. And it's going to take the bits that it wants to combine uh, for different circumstances. So you end up with a bespoke approach to your design methodology every time. And I can see that in the course here this week, having spoken to the instructors and, and trying to gauge what it is. They have a very flexible approach to the teaching of the course. And after about the first 10 minutes on day one, have effectively been using their judgment as design facilitators to shape the course into different um, design methods and tools based on what they gauge in the room uh, from where the students need and where the students might be going and supporting them on their own journey. And you can only do that if you have a core of design facilitators who have knowledge of different design methods with different backgrounds and are not just going through one particular method or another. Uh, so they end up being very similar in that they're both multiple methodology methodologies. So when we compare these, and this is the final part of the study, the analysis and implications uh, of this study. So the first thing we see is historically we see some tensions between different paradigmatic clusters. So looking at the history, the biggest tension is between our technical rationalist methods, and on this slide the pink indicates the uh, civilian designers and the orange indicates the military designers or design methods. So we see a tension, a big tension between our technical rationalists on one hand and our postmodernists and radical structuralists on the other. And this is the big tension that caused uh, in the mid 2000s the Israelis to throw Nave and his institute, which was the Operational uh, Research uh, Theory Institute? Operational Theory and Research Institute, uh, OPRI. Right, so that, that got shut down because uh, Nave was taking this strong postmodernist approach, and using it to very heavily criticise everything that the Israeli Defence Force was doing, and on top of that was doing that with indecipherable language to those who were not initiated in this very complex and hard to grasp concept. So there was a, an initial failure there that, that led to uh, a tension and a conflict and the uh, banishment of, of those methods. There was also uh, a tension between both of these and complex adaptive systems theory. And what's interesting is that these tensions uh, have been reconciled in various ways. So within doctrine, 
the tension seems to have been, been reconciled by taking complex adaptive systems theory, turning it into framing or army design methodology or operational design and putting it into the front of the planning process and saying, hey, we, we, we've achieved a compromise here. But the, the paradigms don't line up. Uh, or uh, between postmodernism and complex adaptive systems theory, it seems that there's been a, a begrudging willingness to accept the different way to come to an understanding of complexity or um, the mess of social interactions and the need for different perspectives uh, without necessarily using the same language uh, to describe the same phenomena. So we see these tensions, but also within each of the paradigms we see methodological similarities. So tension between paradigms, similar methods. What's happened more recently in about the last five or six years with the development of uh, the CFC agnosticism for design methodology and Zweibelson's second generation design and the way Jay Sam now teaches. And what we also see with the human-centered design since the, the mid to late 1990s with the expansion of that to cover not just a design process but a way to think about things and a way to assemble different toolkits within the process is we see these methodologies now drawing on different paradigms. So you can see the big arrows here represent the three original clusters and then the uh, solid and dashed arrows represent the, the different scale of influence uh, that some of these other paradigms have had. Notably, heroism, uh, going back to the Iliad, doesn't seem to have been incorporated anywhere, uh, but the others all seem to have certainly played a role in developing these different toolkits. So what we see now is, instead of a paradigmatic tension but a methodological similarity, we see a paradigmatic uh, convergence but that's been accompanied by what has become a methodological dissimilarity within that convergence. So we have these different institutions, civilian and military, teaching different methods, but all of them are drawing on multiple paradigms, and that tension is now represented by this red arrow here in the middle of the diagram, because we're getting better military-wise at talking to people. And by the way, my thanks to Canadian Forces College for sending me down here. Uh, ben Zweibelson is up there at the moment, so we're getting better with that. But where there's still a big gap is between the civilian side and the military side, and we've only just started to bridge that. So that leads into my concluding observations about the future of design and where we need to go and where we should go. I think where we need to go now is to take pause and to figure out how to achieve a methodological convergence that maximises uh, our utility or our ability to apply the different methods that we've got, because these agnostic methods are still in the early stages and still experimental. They haven't been cemented, they haven't gone broad yet. We need to broaden them, but to do that we need to make sure that we have a more solidified structure before we push it out there. Now this is one of the inherent challenges of design, because the moment your structure is solidified, it's out of date. So if we have to solidify something to go broad and to make sure that we've got it right, it will only be right for that exact moment that we get to that point. Systems achieve perfection on the point of relevance. So we need to find a way to do that and to push it broader, but we need to balance that against the concurrent need to be perpetually innovative and perpetually emergent. And as a result of that, what I think we need to do is figure out a better way to take on board the bits of human-centered design that we want. Because at the moment, we're, we're taking multiple methods, but we are still, because our background as military designers, more heavily leaning towards the military stuff than the civilian stuff. I think it, uh, we could balance that more and quite effectively do it. We then need to figure out a medium to transmit this. Design and doctrine have never aligned well. And if we try and turn design into doctrine, we're going to freeze it and make it out of date, and we're going to pull it into a system which traditionally has been representative of something that it's not, and it can only ever partly be representative of. So we need to figure out our transition from doctrine into something else that can better disseminate and spread these design methods, but can do so in such a way that balances against the fact that the moment you're spreading it, it's out of date. I don't have an answer to that question today. I just I pose that as a challenge going forward, and for me saying, this is what I think we need to do. Now, I could be wrong, and I, I would encourage disagreement with that. I, I would like people to come to me afterwards and say, I think you're wrong. I think you've misread this entire situation. Um, I would also like them to tell me what they think they would, they would see instead. So this is a point for a potential future development. It may or may not emerge. But based on where we are from this historical and paradigmatic analysis, it's the best solution I can offer. And as we all know, one of the design principles is about offering the best solution that you can get and satisficing it's called where you've got a satisfactory
uh, objective on, on time. It's almost like the military saying of 80% on time better than 100% too late. That's what you've got here today. I'm going to end the presentation there and I'm happy noting the time to open the floor for five or ten minutes for questions if, if anybody has any. Uh, again, thank you very much for your attention today. I hope that this has been a somewhat informative brief on the history and also the underlying paradigms behind design methods, but perhaps a limited or insight into where we may go in the near future as well. So thank you and questions from the floor. Yes, up the back. Yeah, uh, it's not so much a question, but I have a suggestion. I thought that um, in addition to a mindset orientation and a process orientation, it could be a very interesting analysis to look at a stance or an orientation to the way that paradigms uh, have towards evidence and data. If you take, yeah. uh, if you take a constitutional scholar who's trying to read uh, the Constitution the way uh, it was read and they're trying to figure out how it was interpreted in the 1700s, you know, that person's going to look at data and evidence very differently from a post-postmodernist or a deconstructivist or a humanist or any number of folks that are aligned with the various paradigms. Uh, and I think that would make your quadrant uh, kind of blow up into a cube or something like that when you take that dimension and that that stance or that attitude to what is acceptable evidence and, and what what is the scope of our data that we're working with and, and how do we view it and how do we analyze it. Mm. That is a very good suggestion and I'm going to go away and investigate that further and I thank you very much for it. I, I don't have anything to say in response other than I think that is a great idea and it's certainly well, worth looking into. I mean, it, I, I guess I, I was thinking along those lines because before I was a doctoral candidate in education, I was a doctoral candidate in English and I knew these literary critics, and it's, you're right, they do have a mindset orientation to try to figure out how to analyze texts because they've essentially thrown up their hands mm. and given up uh, about rationalist, historical, textual analysis, basically mm -hmm. what it is. But they haven't given up on evidence. You know, I think they would tell you that postmodernism died in the 1980s. They were already blown past that. 20 years ago, and we're into post postmodernism and deconstructivism. And I don't even know what they call it now. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Bearing in mind with, with the military that things like postmodernism, the fact that it's only taken 40 years to go from academia into the military, even if it's died in academia, that's actually a pretty quick rate of uptake for a, such a radically different concept. I would also add in, in response to that that to give you an initial to give you an initial look, come on, get back to the slide that I want. Excuse me one moment. My initial guess, and this is actually guess is the wrong word. My initial, um, based on the evidence I've seen, my initial response to that would be that I suspect quantitative data, qualitative data, data doesn't matter. That would probably be the, the rough direction going down that vertical. Obviously, that's a very, very broad. Um, generalization, probably an overgeneralization, but initially that's the way I'd see it um, pending actually doing any research to, to back that up with evidence, which by the way I do value. Yeah. So, um, as somebody who's a current character, structuralist, um, I think data does matter, and I think not defining your terms in a way that is very succinct and tight can be very dangerous. But I do like the way you did this. I just think sometimes drawing the conclusion that. You know, I think you're almost conflating post-structuralism with postmodernism, which I think can be very problematic, and with relativism, which I think is really problematic. So yes. I think maybe yeah. defining your terms like and making it really, really tight. And I'm also rhetorician, so terms matter to me, language matters to me, and context matters. So, but otherwise, I like I really like you. Yeah, thank you. And I actually had that feedback at the conference as well. Was uh, I need to go away and look at postmodernism versus post-structuralism? and confirm that I'm using the correct term. And that came from Chris Paparone, who, who considers himself to be a post-structuralist, and I assessed him to be a postmodernist. So he put his hand up and said, well, he was in the room. I, I disagree with you about my own work, which is um, harrowing when you're up, up giving a presentation. But um, you know, this is 
I, I actually learn by writing and researching. So this is for me as much a learning journey that I'm still testing and adjusting as it is a piece of research that I can give up this feedback and a presentation on. So it's that's now been picked up twice in two presentations. And again, I need to go and add that to my well, not add it, but you know, put a little tick next to it because it's already on my list between now and the final mind graph to, to yeah. tighten that up. Yeah, but I also think it's also good if you look at the theorists you're using, for example, like Foucault, right? I mean, sociologists use him, post uh, structuralists who teach English departments use him very di in di very different ways than a historian would use him. Mm. So I think it's uh, looking at theory in use is also really important, not just defining, okay, this is what it is. Here's how I'm defining it. Here's the parameters I'm putting on, you know, my definition. And here's, what, here's the kind of political work that this definition is doing in order to advance my argument. That's the, probably a safer perspective. True, although if I did that for all of these yeah, paradigms, yeah, we, the yeah, paper would be that. infinitely long. Yeah, so long at, at some point, what I've had to do is generalize enough oh, yeah. that, that you know, it, it's something that I can put out there and I can finish that has some kind of utility. Uh, because you know, all, of these, all of these different paradigms, and um, there's a dozen of them, they have their own lineage and their own disciplines and their own background and their own development. So what I've had to do, and I, I say this in the written paper, is I've had to take a near enough is good enough approach um, and get to that point of where or I consider to be a diminishing return. Uh, and that's what I've done. So even with the lineup, when I start putting on the different paradigms, uh, not different paradigms, sorry, the different design, civilian and military design thinkers, uh, the fact that they end up next to a paradigm doesn't mean they precisely align with that. Design is an inter-paradigmatic and multi-paradigmatic thing. Uh, and it always has been and always will be. And where they sit on this chart relative to the paradigms is a best fit. It's not a design thinker X is next to this paradigm, therefore that's what they conform with. It's based on the quadrants uh, on the vertical and horizontal scales, and it's all relative and it's all flexible over time, and it is a generalization. So in, in my defense, uh, I think the generalization is good enough to be useful. You know, all models are wrong, some are wrong and useful. I think, I, I think and I stand by this one being a useful one, despite needing a few tweaks. But, but it is still at one level or another wrong. Yeah. Okay, so real quick on the whole, uh, the, the idea of data as well, and the rise of big data, and the, the kind of misuse of big data that they're finding now that, you know, numbers lie and liars use numbers, right? So they can, they can, everybody can find something to support their stuff. So from that perspective of data and evidence, it would be also look at the acceptance of counter data to their, their point, to kind of flip it on yeah. its head. Not necessarily, can they, they, do they use data to support their position, but do they acknowledge the counter data? Yeah. That's there as well, versus totally discounting it. Yeah, yeah, and that comes back to the, that first comment about the approach to data and the, the approach to evidence. Uh, and I've seen some stuff in the civilian design literature coming out like as recently as a couple of months ago on Medium about if you want to innovate, you can't be data driven because regardless of whether or not the data is accurate, inaccurate, how you interpret it, etc., you're extrapolating from the past and projecting out into the future and you're not actually creating something new, you're just adapting to what you've seen. And adaption and creation are similar, but they're different in the sense that adaption is reactive to exploit the situation, whereas creation is about creating a situation to exploit. I'll take one last question, note of the time, just from Debbie. I was, um... I love the framework that you developed there, and I was uh, taken by the fact that all the methods you were looking at, the methodology was in the upgoing, you know, uh, left to lower, to lower right. But I think most of the practitioners that you would like to convince on a method actually would find themselves falling along an axis that runs from the lower left to the upper right, and maybe that's where some of the resistance is coming from. In that the methods that we try to teach the practitioners yep. are radically different from the way they see themselves along that. Mm -hmm other access. So in about 10 days from now, I'm going to put a, a blog post up on Small Wars Journal and it's called The Process Works, We Just Need to Use It. <laughs> right? Subheading is why you're wrong. Because I hear a lot of people say on a routine basis, the only problem with NDMP, JPP, MAP in Australia is that we don't use it. And I, refuse, I, I completely reject that argument on two grounds. Right? The first is, show me the proof that we don't use it. Because I have now spent half a decade trying to find that proof, and it sits in the realm of headquarters, most of which are doing classified stuff, which unless you're in there, you can't see. 
So at best, that's an anecdotal argument based on, based on what that one person's experience is, and they cannot collect, like the plural of anecdote is not data, right? They cannot collect enough without going to enough different headquarters to get an adequate answer to that question to prove that that assertion is anything other than a gut instinct. The second counter-argument to it completely undermines the first one, which is, well, let's assume for a minute that the only problem with the OPP, JPP, NDMP, MAP is that we don't use it. Well, tell me that isn't broken anyway, because what good is this process if it, we can't use it, right? We, we're not, if we're not using it, we're obviously not using it for a reason, right? So what we ought to be doing is looking at saying, well, what is that reason? Is it too long? Are there too many steps? Are there too many sub-steps? Is it too hard for people to figure out? Is it not suited to purpose, i.e. what we need in the operational environment? So even if your insertion is true, it then counteracts itself because you're, um, it, it becomes self-contradictory because you're now saying, well, the only problem with this is we don't do it, but you're not saying why is that, right? And the answer to that why is, is, is important and we don't look into that. But I don't think we can collect enough data uh, to say whether or not our, our methods work and that's a, big, that's a big problem and a big issue. I can't go into it, coming back directly now to what you said, I can't go and find out exactly what practitioners are doing and map them on this because I can't have access to where I go to need to collect the evidence just because of the nature of what it is that we do. So that would be a brilliant study and I would love to do it. Unfortunately, I haven't found a way to make it practically feasible yet. Yeah, Yogi Berra said that in theory, theory and practice align, in, in practice they don't. Hey Jacob, so as the guy in the room with the evidence, as your chief of plans, I can say it does have a purpose, we're using it for the wrong purpose. Okay. It does have a purpose, we're using it for the wrong purpose. I would love to engage with that, but noting the time and the, the number of the people in this room are students who have to go back to class, I think that's a, a good point for us to sit on at that point. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much again for your attention and engagement today. I appreciate it. Uh, so, historically, the, uh, the guest lecturers received both a black and a blue pen from Jay Sow as uh, tokens of appreciation. I was the new guy. I don't know where they keep the pens, so you're going to have to settle for a coin for Mr. Hamlet uh, Thank Thank you. Harris' desk. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please check your hands. Thank you all very much.